we're more optimistic about diabetes care in the next five years than we've been for many years because the leadership of the NHS is really taking diabetes, both its prevention and its care, seriously. But we're optimistic about something that nobody else is optimistic about, and that's the, the economic squeeze, because we know that diabetes prevention and integrated care with people at the centre can save huge sums of money for the NHS. I am optimistic that if we do get the resource and the commitment to general practice, that we will see things start to turn round. And so actually, for doctors coming into the profession now and other colleagues, probably this is the best time in a generation to be entering into uh, general practice as a career. The introduction of a five-year task force which will map out the real deliverables for achieving parity of esteem for mental health uh, it gives me cause for hope that for the first time in a very long time mental health is at the forefront of NHS thinking. Drastic changes and more money, the medicine prescribed by NHS bosses to preserve the health service. The new head of NHS England wants GPs and hospitals to operate differently and says people should take more responsibility for their health. A comprehensive, tax-funded national health service of the sort that the nation clearly wants remains entirely doable, even despite the difficult economic circumstances that continue to face this country. So the NHS, we've set out our stall as to why change is going to be needed over the next five years and what it's going to take. But the best way of answering the question, how, is to go ask the people who are going to make it happen. So Susan, we're sitting here in your new PATH lab, very impressive, but what about staffing pressures? What's the story there? We've increased our nurses on the, on the wards a lot over the last um, three or four years. And we have seen reductions um, in pressure ulcers and falls and that kind of thing. So it has really been um, valuable and Im improved patient safety. But there is a, an issue about just being able to recruit nurses. And we've also got concerns about the inflexibility that just having nurse ratios has. I think that there's, there's something around the blend of staff you have. And, and just having nurses as the input is restrictive, I think. You're a fairly small hospital. Do you think district general hospitals have a future? The only way that I think that we, we and other hospitals like us can really survive is be, be, becoming part of a, a network, part of a system. And for us, at one end, there is having tertiary relationships, which are very mature and sophisticated which means the patients can get treated locally, we can have tertiary providers that come and use our facility, helping us pay for it, but patients get treated locally. And at the other end, we have relationships with the GPs. And if we can do both, so that you can get patients treated in the lowest cost and environment, as close as they can to their own home, you can get specialist support when you need it. Of this requires uh, hospitals and general practice to work together very closely so that we um, share information about the patients, we operate a very safe clinical service and we deliver care closer to home for the patients for their benefit. And I suspect that in some areas we may find that actually we can deliver uh, virtually all of uh, the outpatient um, services. We worked out that we could change what the front end of primary care looked like in terms of people accessing us digitally, we could change the back end in terms of um, bigger scale and also we could develop into things like community care so that some of the specialised services that traditionally were delivered in hospitals would be better delivered uh, closer to the patient in our GP practices. The fact that they can get hold of us uh, relatively easily by phone means that particularly parents with young children um, feel much more confident in their GP practice. Before the new system we had to go down there and sit in the surgery and it was full of people coughing and spluttering and kids crying and screaming. <laughs> but it's so much easier now. The app is a new way for patients to access their general practitioner. 
from that screen, it will either give you directions as to how to get to your surgery, you can push a one button and it will call your surgery directly, or you can click on a button to enter what your problem is, confirm your details, press submit, and then we will call you back or we will Skype you back from the surgery. It's always a simple. I mean, I'm, I'm 72 and I can use it so anybody can. <laughs> the hardest thing usually revolves around relationships and making sure that people understand uh, where we're going. Most secondary care providers are keen to have less outpatient activity, but how does that work in terms of their finances? And how do we make sure that we don't destabilise a community care provider, a secondary care provider, um, so that they're, they're in a win-win situation as well as us? So this morning I'm off to Manchester to spend time with the NHS and with local government. Devo Mank is an area where people are thinking quite radically about the way to join up services and to promote healthy communities. And the first person I'm going to be seeing is Howard Bernstein, the Chief Executive of Manchester City Council. I think it's very important that when we talk about Devo Mank that we look at health alongside work, alongside employment, transport, all the key uh, drivers of growth. One of the big challenges of all is how we secure uh, a fiscally sustainable uh, system of health social care over the next five years or possibly uh, more. We've got to ask ourselves do we need to do things 10 or 15 times? Uh, can we do them uh, once? We have to join up. We, we, we have to start to break down those institutional barriers between local government assets and NHS assets and other public service assets and start to address them as community assets. <laughs> We're storing up serious problems with the health of our kids because one in ten children when they start primary school these days is obese, not overweight, obese. That's one in five by the time you get to year six. So here in Manchester they're getting practical about trying to tackle that and so we're now off to the Health Academy in Withenshaw to hear what they're doing. schools in Manchester have got an agenda to improve students and community health, so particularly against the national agenda of obesity and uh, child development and so on, and the influences that schools can have on that. So it's a, it's a Manchester one, it's a national agenda as well. But here we have the benefit of the sponsor, Central Manchester Hospitals Foundation Trust, and they provide us opportunities for students to really get into not just the physical side of health, but realise that there's emotional health to look at, social health, so various aspects, and I think the links that we have with sponsor enables us to drive that really effectively. A health promoting school is one that views their students uh, in a very holistic way. We recognise that students have got all kinds of needs, not just physical, but really around their emotional health and well-being, because we know that that affects their attainment and their, their success whilst they're here. We've seen all the trends from the days gone old in the old high schools where it was chips and burgers and Coca-Cola. So I've seen over the years how, how it's changed and it's, it's good because you know there's a lot of obesity, especially in Manchester, and we have to get you know we have to be responsible for that. We hide vegetables in cakes, we do chocolate and beetroot, we do courgette ones, everybody's happy, we make wraps, we put salad in the wraps, and that way it's gradually introduced into their diet. Hi, Simon Stevens. Nice to meet you. Hello, Frank. John, you've been looking after your mum, I understand, yeah. for some time now? Yeah, mum was diagnosed with what's called mixed dementia, so right. Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, just over, well, just six years ago now. And um, I took long and on the scene and mm. looked after her and, and um, still am doing. I immediately went to the library and started reading up as much as I could about like, right. dementia and Alzheimer's. And, a lot of it is, is about the clinical side of it, mm. but not the practical side of it about how to help look after it better. Yeah. But obviously things have moved on a lot in all in, in those six years. Mm -hmm. um, and now there's a lot more um, available to support carers and to support the people with, with dementia. I could make or help make the uh, Countess of Chester Hospital the most dementia friendly in the world. But what's the point if the community in which it sits isn't? It doesn't make any sense to me. So we need to work not only in partnership with our social care colleagues, but also our communities too. 
if we want people with dementia to live better with their dementia, we need to support carers to care well with their dementia. And part of that for me is sharing our information, sharing our knowledge. It's where people um, in Tesco's, people in banks, uh, in football clubs, everywhere, is given a bit more knowledge about what dementia is. What does the health service need to do differently to put itself on a sustainable path for the next four or five years? I think it needs to be more inclusive. I, need, I think it needs to come out, out behind the walls of its own hospital, um, get out into the community, start spreading the wealth of, um, of, of what it does best, and working in true partnership with people to manage some risks as well. So Tim, you've been visiting just about every hospital in the country, what have you found? I found that everybody still wants the NHS to provide free care, I think people are very committed to the health service, but I think that having been around the country and seen the variation in practice, especially in orthopaedics, that in places there's unwanted variation and we're going to have to make some changes. We found surgeons having a go at complex work and if you're doing low volumes you're hiring in kit and we found costs for loaning kit for over a year on average across the country each trust about 250,000 but some trusts were spending 750,000 and if you just look at hip and knee replacement we found the same implant of a knee in one trust of a thousand pounds and in another trust it was 1800 pounds and that trust was doing the highest volume and what's been very interesting around the country is that every hospital I've been to they all think they're getting the best deal and they've told me they're getting the best deal and they clearly aren't so huge amount of variation if we sort out we could easily save, I think, that just in orthopaedics alone across the NHS, £2 billion over five years, and I think that's a conservative estimate.